About a week or so ago, someone let me know about this article right here, Free Software, an idea whose time has passed by Robert M. Lefkowitz. I'm going to say I'm bad with names, but that seems right in my head. And overall, this is a really, really well-written article. I cannot fault the author on that front, but what I can fault the author on is on some of their opinions. Now, I'm not going to be reading through the entire article because this is about a 20-minute read. So if you want to read it for yourself, there'll be a link in the description down below. I'm just going to go through some of the arguments being made in it. The author starts off by describing how free software actually came into existence, at least through his interpretation, and what actually existed prior to it, which he describes as public software. The idea of public software was software that anybody could freely use, which basically describes the idea of freeware. And moving on from that, he describes what his relationship with free and open source software is, and I don't really have anything to critique here. This is just his experience through history. The thing I do want to critique is his first argument, though. As he says here, the first sign that free software is intellectually bankrupt is that the Free Software Foundation seems unable to develop new generations of leadership. Now, the Free Software Foundation throughout the history of free software has been an incredibly important organization, being the organization that actually created it. But one issue that's being made here is that the idea of free software and the Free Software Foundation are being tied together as if they are inherently the same thing. Even if the Free Software Foundation was to go away tomorrow, I don't think that has any effect on the idea of free software because free software has grown to be much, much bigger than just the foundation. There are supporters of free software who have absolutely no love for the Free Software Foundation. So tying these two ideas together doesn't really make any sense. And the other issue here is that just because the leadership hasn't changed doesn't mean that they can't find new leadership. If you've ever been online, you would know that there are people who are supporters of free software who might even be more devout than people like Richard Stallman. It's not like you can't find new leadership. It may be that they don't want to change the leadership, which might actually be a problem with the organization. Next, he says that the Free Software Foundation is famously fixated on insisting that be given credit for Linux, caring about who gets the credit more than successfully creating change is not a good look. Linux is perhaps the child that succeeded where GNU failed. Now, this is a really bizarre statement, and I don't know if this person has ever used Linux because most modern Linux distros ship with GNU utils and if you took away those utils modern Linux wouldn't be anything like it is today. While we can make the argument that caring about credit is probably not a good look, this last part just doesn't make any sense at all. Now this part I know some people aren't going to like this, but I completely agree with. So thirdly, the rhetoric of free software devotees is awkward and unconvincing. The inflexibility that has failed to evolve the talking points to make them more effective is a failure of politics. So what he's referring to here is the term free software itself. And he uses two examples. The first one is if we say something like free frying pans, no one thinks that you're referring to the freedom of the frying pans, what you're actually referring to is the cost of it because it's an inanimate object and you can't give an inanimate object freedom. Whereas if you say something like free press, because the press is made up of people with their own wills, what you're actually referring to here is freedom of the press. But then the term free software doesn't make any sense because if you talk to someone who isn't actually interested in the free software movement and you say free software, they're going to think you're talking about the price of the software, but what you're actually talking about is the freedom of the users of the software, which doesn't really logically follow. Now, the author doesn't actually provide an alternate name that could be used. Basically, they just go through this argument, say it is meaningless gibberish, which I, I do completely agree with, and then just go on. But I think there should be something used in its place. Personally, I think the term freedom software does make a bit more sense because if you say freedom software, 
Firstly, you're not referring to a term that already has meaning to people who don't care about free software. And when you say freedom software, you can then very easily explain after that that what you're referring to is freedom respecting software. Instead of having to go on this long spiel about how you mean free doesn't mean free, it actually means freedom. Just putting freedom in the name makes a bit more sense. The author sort of sums up the problem here. The free software coterie is fond of insisting that words mean what they say they mean, and that is a profound misunderstanding of the nature of language. Such linguistic naivety is not an asset in pursuing political goals. From this point on, we're going to be jumping a bit around the article just because it makes a bit more sense for my argument. So what I want to talk about now is bad actors. No, not those bad actors you see in movies. Bad actors as in people who want to do malicious things with software. And this is usually used as one of the strongest arguments for FOSS because anyone who wants to has the ability to go and audit the code base and see exactly what is running on their system. But the author tries to rebut this argument by basically missing the point. As he says here, when bad actors are engaging in nefarious activity, a much better solution than having everybody auditing every line of source code for every bit of software they use is to pass laws criminalizing such behavior and having a government cybercrime division tasked with punishing people who do that. And I can't disagree that that's a better solution, but these two solutions aren't mutually exclusive. And also, having the ability to actually audit code doesn't mean that every single person who uses the code has to audit it. That is not the point at all. Giving individuals the ability to audit the source code and having the government audit the source code can both happen at the exact same time, and, and al already does. If someone wants to go and audit the source code because maybe they want to have some peace of mind, I think that's a perfectly fine thing to do. But if you just want to go and download a binary, that's perfectly fine as well, but the government isn't an infinite entity and there's some areas of code which will just never be audited by a government body. So giving individuals the option to do that makes far more sense. A bit earlier in the article, he mentions that back in the 80s, IBM shipped all of their systems with the source code for the operating system and as people were using it, they modified it and went back to IBM for support and what they ultimately realized is that most of their users didn't want the freedom to actually modify the source code or to audit the source code, they actually wanted freedom from the source code. And that's how they came up with something known as an OCO program, an object code only program basically an application binary. And I'm sure that a lot of people did want to have freedom from source code. If you're, say, doing some basic data entry job, there's no reason why you need direct access to the source code. Or if you're doing, I don't know, you're running a call center or something like that. There's no reason why people like that needed the source code, but having a freedom from the source code and freedom to access the source code if you want to can both exist. Look at a modern Linux system, for example. Most people do have freedom from the source code. Most people, when they download an application, just download it with their package manager, and they never actually see the source code for it. They just accept that what they're downloading is what they're supposed to be downloading. But if you want to go and access the source code for something like Ranger or Awesome or whatever other applications you have installed on your system, you can actually go and do so. Here is my absolute favorite argument in the entire article. Protecting myself from bad actors is not my job, it is the government's job. And then he goes on this long spiel about Americans with guns and the military, which is a whole nother topic which I'm not getting into in this video. Completely ignoring that though, this is such a paper-thin argument. Let's say that he's crossing the road. Is it the government's job to make sure that he doesn't get hit by a car? If you said yes, I feel very, very sorry for you because you have been very misled. Just as protecting yourself in your daily life is important because the police can't teleport, so is the ability to audit code if you would like to. There is more to that argument, but there's one thing in here that indicates the author has no idea what they're talking about, and that is 
Free software rights like to use beer metaphors. Free as in beer. Let me suggest that if one were concerned with bad actors, one wouldn't drink purchased beer or free beer. One would brew one's own beer because bad actors might have poisoned the beer, and one would have to grow one's own hops. And what might one use for water to brew the beer? Bad actors might have poisoned the water supply. One would dig one's own well, unless, of course, the bad actors have polluted the water table. This way lies temperance. Now, the beer metaphor is used in so far as to describe that free software doesn't mean free as in beer. That's that's all it's used for. If you think it's used for anything else, you have no idea what the metaphor is. Along with also completely reversing the metaphor and basically describing free software as meaning free as in beer, which is completely backwards. He continues on with not understanding the metaphor. The alternative, of course, is to believe that you could safely purchase beer because of the government's job to keep you safe. We've already been over why it is not the government's job to keep you safe. I'm not going to go back over that. The bad actor conspiracy theorists, I, I love that term, need to believe that many commercial actors are evil and all government actors are ineffective. Software vendors won't usually be inserting spyware into their wares. Now, I don't know what world this person lives in where data collection is not a massive problem, but in the real world, it certainly is. That is the entire business model of things like Google AdSense and social media companies like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so on and so forth. And as he says here, the evils are likely to be petty misdemeanors rather than felonies. Now, you may think that mass data collection and tracking of everything you do in your life is just petty crime, but I live in the real world where this is a serious problem. Later in the article, he goes on to say this. Free softwareians make the argument that without access to the source code, one would not be able to detect the nefarious intent of bad actors, and goes on to explain that when he was working for a large investment bank, they actually had access to the Windows source code, and they were making modifications to it, and as they made modifications, when the new versions of the Microsoft software came out, it wouldn't run properly, and... I will accept that maybe large companies and government organizations probably already have access to the source code. And he says that the GPL or other such licenses will only assist in foiling bad actors if the expectation is that individual hobbyists are responsible for regulating cyberspace and preventing cybercrime. But the thing is that there are plenty of cases where individual hobbyists or small white hat hacking groups that wouldn't have access to the source code do actually do this. It's not to say that every vulnerability is discovered by some random hobbyist, but to discount the fact that a lot of them are is to basically discount that entire industry. If you want to make the argument that the FSF doesn't do enough work to actually promote cybersecurity to the government, that's a perfectly fine argument. I can accept that. Maybe more does need to be done, but to discount the entire idea of free software because of that, doesn't make any sense. We have one more argument and it's basically saying security by obscurity is good. The unimpeded access to source code and running software is more important than the peace of mind that comes from reducing the threat of criminals breaking into your computer and he just cannot stop himself from comparing it to guns. Now as a retired software architect you should probably understand that there are ways to find vulnerabilities in your system even without access to the source code. It's called black box testing. It's a very simple concept. And if your security model is based on the fact that no one knows how your system actually works, I hate to say it, but your system is not secure and needs a lot of work. If it cannot be secure when the source code is public, there is a serious problem with your system and nobody should be using it. There's a lot of other stuff he talks about in this article, a lot of which I either don't disagree with or there's just not really much to say about it. So I recommend going and reading this for yourself and just seeing some of the other stuff he mentions in here. He sort of gets a bit into copyright law and patent law in the US, which isn't a topic I really know that much about. So I'll just accept that he knows what he's talking about when it comes to that. So 
I think this is pretty much everything for me. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chico Bento, Jamie Joseph, Mitchell Pitti, Stephen Tony Sushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you want to go support me, work them links down below to my Patreon, subscribe star, Libra Pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast tech over t available basically anywhere and then this channel is available on odyssey and bit if you'd like to watch it somewhere that isn't youtube so i think that's pretty much everything for me and i'm out <laughs>